This has been a day over six months in the making, and this has been us working internally on our end really hard to to do something we're really excited about. We have with us today, Suzanne. We're going to have her quickly say hi so that you guys know just how long we'll be talking without her before she kind of gets brought back in. Suzanne, how are you doing today? Hey, guys. Doing great. I feel like uh, this is a big day. It's finally here. Really big day. I'm practicing underwater. And so, uh, Matt, how are you doing today? I'm so excited we're finally able to share this. As we'll tell in the story here, it's been since November we've known about this. So to sit on something like that, that's not my MO. I, I blurred out whatever's going on. So this has been unique for me. Yep. And if you guys remember, there was a picture that we posted on my Instagram, which has like no followers. <laughs> and it is a uh, photo of Matt, Richard, and I on a mountain um, down here in Arizona. And what happened was we started practice underwater. And Matt and I, we both, you know, we're dentists first, coaches second. And, you know, the majority of our income, the majority of our time is spent in our practices. And coaching is something we do for fun, you know, on the side. And we help people and it's great. And we sort of had this expectation for how many clients we'd be willing to take on before the time commitment was a little bit too much. And we started practice underwater back in August. So it's been almost a year now, 10 months. And we started practice underwater. And by November, you know, we had this partner meeting where we were going to sit down and kind of, you know, repivot and figure out what the future direction of shared practices was. And at that time, Matt and I had pretty much the number of clients we said we could handle just from doing practice underwater for a few months. And a lot of the feedback we gotten was so positive. And the, you know, I think our coaching was showing that, you know, kind of our metrics and mindsets and everything that we really believe in at shared practices from a coaching perspective was really working well. And so it was an interesting, almost a conundrum of sorts where we realize the impact of the work that we do while also recognizing we can't do as much of it as is needed or that we want to do. So Matt, kind of talk about that from your perspective, you know, that realization that we came to and, and what that was like for you. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you credit for the idea. It was you who jump started this. I mean, I think we were both kind of feeling tapped out and feeling like either the practice or our client interactions were squeezed time-wise. Um, so you were much more on the forefront thinking that, hey, let's bring on someone with a lot of ex coaching experience who can be a full-time coach for share practices. And then we are focusing on other areas of, of growing our business. Um, so I think it was tough for me to let go of first because I always felt, you know, I'm coming on to share practices. I'm going to be a coach. I'm going to do this for years. But you really opened up my eyes to that. That's not a sustainable model. You know, like you said, we're dentists first. Um, and this coaching is something we do on the side. And you know, once we grew to our capacity and we had more inquiries come and we had nowhere to put them. And rather than create a waiting list, do something like that, you had this brilliant idea, you presented to us and it's taken off since then. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, if you've sent me a client inquiry for coaching and I haven't responded, um, sorry, but <laughs> that's been me for the last six months is, you know, I, I'll only respond to the inquiries that sound very exciting and the rest of them, I just kind of let go. And that's not a sustainable practice. You know, Matt and I, I think we we sort of realized, okay, the idea of dentist coaching is appealing on a lot of levels, but it's also not sustainable on a lot of levels from a, you know, as doing, as, you know, I don't think it's sustainable on a long-term scale and where we can really, you know, create a big impact for our audience, you know, as a whole. Because I think, and Matt can attest to this, the biggest value thing we do is one-on-one -on -one coaching. You know, the, the transformation that that individual, you know, receives as a result of working with us and the, the impact it has on their practice, their lifestyle, their income, everything. Uh, there is no single thing we do at Shared Practices that is a bigger benefit to any one person than one-on-one -on -one coaching. And we don't ever want to take away from that and become like a mastermind only where we don't do anything one-on-one. -on -one. We always want to be one-on-one. -on -one. And that's where we sort of made the realization that we need somebody who can grow this for us. And we need somebody who can who can really kind of take this to the next level. So um, Matt, do you feel like that kind of lays the foundation where I can now talk about, you know, how I found Suzanne and and kind of what happened from there? Yeah. And I think it's important to realize this is kind of a normal arc of coaching businesses, consulting as well. Like uh, take Wendy Briggs, for example. Like if you call Wendy Briggs' company, you're probably not getting Wendy Briggs on the phone. She's probably not going to be your coach. You know, once they tap out with their initial starters, they move on to other people to do more full-time coaching for them. And I think that's kind of the trajectory that we're on. And um, 
something that you made me realize is a very normal trajectory in this business. Yeah. And I think it comes back to, you know, what is our why? Well, our why is to impact as many people as possible in the best way possible. And I think we also saw some gaps in our own coaching, you know, some areas where we felt like we weren't as, you know, polished as somebody who's been doing this for a long time. And so we made the decision to go look out for somebody. And so I, I reached out to a consultant in my area, Suzanne. Here's what I wanted. I wanted, you know, and we kind of make the joke, but Matt, you know, we always, I think the fact that we don't have a whole lot of private practice experience, right? Like I've been doing this for two years. Matt's been doing this for two years after residency or three years. And, you know, Richard is, has yet to practice full-time private practice. So what we offer in innovation and brilliance and, you know, everything, we also lack in just having done this in hundreds of practices. And so that's what I really wanted is an area where we didn't have a solution to, to when we're going to bring someone in to, to present this. And so I, I researched and we wanted it to be based in Phoenix. I think that was one thing we were really looking for was somebody in Phoenix. Um, because if we end up, you know, with a brick and mortar location, we can start building our team here. And so... I found uh, Suzanne, and from the second I read her profile, I was like, wow. So this is what I read online. And so she has a local, you know, she she had her own local consulting business and has it here in the Valley and um, online. So Mercer Advisors is one of the largest, you know, back in the day in office consulting companies. And from my understanding, and Suzanne, you could kind of correct me when, you're, when I let you finally talk. It's been seven <laughs> minutes now. Um, but, you know... She was I'm in charge here of patiently, just so you know. <laughs> but you were in charge of right forty six in office consultants for Mercer Advisors. Is that correct? That is exactly right. So you did we, your homework, George. Yeah, and I, I saw that, and I was blown away. And so I reached out to her, and initially she thought I was a client. And so um, I remember, you know, finally, you know, she called me, and then um, we were talking. And in my head, I'm like, wow, this, this, like, you know, this. She's had so much experience, and she's she's been where we want to go, which is in charge of a lot of people. So she's done that from a, she's been the consultant as she is currently in her own business. And she's also been in charge of consultants. And so she could help us build what is, you know, potentially a really sustainable, solid, very high performing, you know, structure. And so reaching out to you, that was what was going through my mind. And it's funny because you thought I was a client. So I kind of want to hear your side of the story now. Um, because, you know, that phone call was initially you, you thought I was just kind of calling you so that you could come into my practice and help me out. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I was I was basically interested, but at the same time intrigued. First of all, um, when you left the message, I don't know if you remember this, George, but I, I didn't understand the whole name, basically, and why you were calling. So when I called back, we kind of had the opportunity to discuss this at, at length, but uh, it was a fun call. Yeah, so I remember I uh, the, the moment that completely sold me was so... You know, I think if you haven't already gathered, I am enamored by Suzanne's ability to help owners. That is just obvious to, you know, in every level. And the more you hear from her, the more you'll see it. I mean, so in my perspective, you know, I'm looking to buy a second practice. I've said that. And Suzanne and I, I want her to be a partner with me in that second practice. That's what I feel about her ability to own, run, operate a practice. So if that doesn't say what I feel about her ability to do that, then I don't know what does. Um, but what really sold me on her needing to come to us is when we started talking about pre-owners and she's like, oh, well, I do uh, financial due diligence for brokers here in the Valley. And that was for me that unique blend of expert in pre-ownership and ownership I don't think we'll ever find again. And that is so perfectly suited for our audience. And that was where, you know, her and I both kind of said to each other on the phone, we need to meet. Like, I remember we both kind of said that. I was like, oh my gosh, wait to hear about our audience. It's very pre-owner driven. And it was just this, um, it was just this moment where it just felt like such synergy. I mean, do you remember that? Do you remember that moment on the phone call, Suzanne? I do. And I think you used the right word, synergy. It was just, uh, you know, one of those, okay, meant to be type moments. Uh-huh. Definitely. And so then um, Richard and Matt, they flew out and then we met Suzanne and uh, we sat down and we talked and, you know, I'm kind of curious now to really turn the tables and, and I want Suzanne, you know, to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, your experiences, what made this feel like a great fit for you. And then, um, you know, I guess kind of what your impressions were of us. I mean, we're just, I mean, you must have looked at us like, what, who are these guys and what are they doing? You know, like I can imagine there was initial skepticism. <laughs> 
Well, you know, I think I told you guys both that, and I, I told Richard this as well as, is, uh, I'm really honored to first and foremost, I think the audience needs to hear that. I'm really honored that I was basically the chosen one, if you will. Um, but yeah, every, I, feel, I feel like everything I've done up to now is leading up to this. This is the perfect time for us all to be joining forces. You know, all of the experience, everything I've done, everything I've enjoyed, all of the mentorship and and all of the coaching experience has led me to, to, to this kind of place here where I was a fan of the podcast from the get-go. You know, I mentioned that to you, George. I had been listening to the podcast and, and giggling just like all the audience giggles and getting to know you guys. Um, and Matt, as you joined, getting to know you as well. So it's been awesome just getting to know you guys as people as well. Um, you know, so so from an experience standpoint, I think joining forces just made sense. Uh, you mentioned Mercer Advisors, large consulting company. I mean, I've been in dentistry basically my whole life. And Matt, I'm going to ignore all the age and everything. That we <laughs> Please, talked about. Let's ignore that. Yeah, <laughs> let's move right past that. <laughs> I look younger than I am. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> right. You definitely do. So while well, he opened that can of worms, I had to close he it. totally did. Yeah, let's just cut that <laughs> tight. You know, and at Mercer Advisors, I, I developed a 360 program, which had sort of a financial and a transitions and a coaching component to it. And, you know, we kind of took that on on the road, boots on the ground in the offices. And, and I, I created a phone coaching component to that uh, program as well. So it totally makes sense with everything that you guys are doing and, and the, the stress or the strap that you both feel um, as, you know, as owners. And I think that's the unique kind of synergy that we have to bring to the audience is the fact that you guys come from that doctor perspective. And then I've got all the uh, in-office phone coaching and team experience to kind of blend that all together. Yeah. And Suzanne, so for our audience, you know, we know so much about your background, but you know, they know at this point, nothing. And so kind of take them through your career, you know, how did you get to where you're at and what did that entail? You know, it's, it's been quite the journey. So, for me, and I, I hate to really talk, you know, way back in terms of being dental assistant, but I think that's where I absolutely fell in love with dentistry is being a dental assistant, moved into treatment coordinator, financial coordinator. I loved all of those roles. But really, when I began teaching dental assisting, that's where I discovered that passion for mentorship and coaching. So that's kind of where it started. Um, I got recruited for that large company, Mercer Advisors. And uh, that was that was an awesome school. It was a great foundation for coaching, a great foundation for mentorship. And that that role kind of evolved from on-site consultant or phone coach to uh, being a mentor, a coach to the coaches. So as you alluded to earlier, George, I worked with 40, a team of 47 coaches. Um, I was a coach to those coaches, if you will, did a lot of the quality assurance, you know, and and, and worked on that end. And then um the company evolved and and was sold at, at a point to Patterson Dental. So my next gig was working with the territory reps. Um, you know, it, I loved that experience. I built the business and dentistry program for the, the reps so that they could bring that to their clients. But I felt like at that point, things were out of my control. Um, it was the territory rep with the doctor. It, it wasn't necessarily in my control. So I decided to kind of go back to basics and, and um, just go back to the hands-on. So, so I developed my own thing. And basically, that's what led me to shared practices. When I work with you, it's like, wow, she's such a better coach than me. Our clients are so lucky for the opportunity to get to work with you. And then from a director of coaching, which is your role here at Shared Practices, as more and more people need us, we have somebody who's done it, who has scaled and has been in charge of other coaches. You, as an infrastructural piece to what we do, allows our coaching to be sustainable long-term. I want you to talk about your impressions of our methodologies and what were your initial impressions of it? Well, you guys have really preached analytics and metrics right from the get-go, and that's definitely up my alley. I'm very metrics-driven. So if every team has blind spots and it takes the metrics take away from the emotional side, the specifics of a patient. I think when you guys were preaching practice by numbers, that was right up my alley, right? I'm a big proponent of what you focus on works, it moves in the right direction. And so um, when a doctor is making a certain decisions about things like adding hygiene hours or adding a team member, whatever it may be, 
some of the areas that you're coaching doctors that really spoke to me, keeping score basically. So um, the other thing that I I so appreciated about you guys right from the get go is the, the non cookie cutter approach. And I think a lot of coaches fall into that trap of just the routine and the mundane and, you know, okay, I'm going to start with a, B and C, and that's what I'm going to implement in every practice. And I think where we align is we're the opposite of cookie cutter, right? We are so customized in our approach and um, just really whatever we're treatment planning with, with our clients has everything to do with what is right into um, the office basically and what they're dealing with. Now, Suzanne, you're in a unique position because you have been an in-office consultant and you've had clients that you coach remotely. So I'm curious, uh, I think it'd be useful for our audience to hear some of the advantages of being a remote coach and how that can instill a greater sense of leadership and ownership in the doctor you're coaching. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. I, I, I get that question a lot. I think people are curious about whether they can get the same results with remote coaching versus on-site coaching, right? Um, you know, there's definitely a value to on-site coaching, right? I've been an on-site coach for years. There's there's a lot of value in that. But I think what, what we often fall into the trap of is becoming a, a dependent relationship. And I think that happens on both sides. I think from an on-site coach's perspective, um, it's easy to fall into the trap of kind of feeling like I'm a team member, you know? And so my goal is, is really teaching the doctors and the team members to fish as opposed to fishing for them or doing it for them. So I think there's an opportunity here for growing as a coach and, uh, I, growing as a, as a leader in the practice, you know, leaders becoming coaches, basically taking on certain responsibilities, um, that they wouldn't naturally take on, for example, if I was on site. So I think shared practice has always done a, a great job at, at teaching doctors about that word sustainability. Um, remote coaching encourages these doctors to take on more of a leadership role and to, to develop their teams into leaders as well. And, you know, you brought up a, you kind of touched on an interesting point, but I think it's really worth highlighting. To date, we have only ever coached doctors. We have never communicated with the team. And one really large value add we see is that you have experience remote coaching teams. And that, I mean, can you talk about the ability to implement things when you talk directly to the team versus through the doctor? Absolutely. So, you know, talking with the doctor has, of course, it's, it's, treatment planning capabilities, we agree on an action item, but I feel like over, um, let's say a 30 day cycle where I feel like the ball gets dropped is okay. The, how do I do this? That's kind of the missing piece. So incorporating Mm -hmm. team members into our discussions, uh, even if it's on a quarterly basis or uh, every other month, for example, we have the opportunity to then say, okay, Mary at the front desk, you're going to work on reactivation. Here's how you're going to do it. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. And I think uh, team members appreciate that as well because the doctor comes back with a, hey, do reactivation. And how do you do that? Well, I don't know. Figure it out, right, is mostly the answer. I heard this on a podcast. You got to do reactivation. Or my coach said you got to do reactivation. But how to do it, I think, is the missing link. Mm -hmm. And so what our audience or what our clients are going to get with me is, the how to's. Yeah. And I think that it can't be understated how much of a pain point that is as a coach. And I'm sure George would agree with this, that uh, dealing with the staff members through the dentist is the most challenging part. When you have mm-hmm. a team member who a hygienist who's not willing to take an FMX in an hour with a cleaning, or you have a manager who can't collect money or can't uh, enforce the financial policies, like that's our biggest stop with coaching currently. And like ha- having that avenue to talk to the team member directly is such an asset and will allow the dentist to implement the changes so much more efficiently and easier with that involved. Mm-hmm. For me, it's AR. It's, you know, I look at the client's AR days and practice by numbers and it's like 60 AR days. I'm like, okay, we have an AR problem. But I am not equipped to talk to their office manager or whoever is up front about it. And they don't know what they're doing either. Obviously, they have an AR problem. And so, you know, it's it's stuff like that that we can't get resolved efficiently. And that's where we really see, you know, a huge benefit. Well, I think it avoids, George, you talking about the same thing over and over every month, right? If it's an AR issue, okay, in 30 days, it'll be an AR issue. In 30 days, we'll be talking about, hey, you got to get that AR under control. 
And I think the doctors, it's not for lack of wanting to or, you know, desire to get that done or the fact that they actually see uh, that that's important as well. But it's the how to. Mm -hmm. So, again, we met with Suzanne in November. She completely blew us away. Um, We I think we prepared her offer on the car ride back to George's house, I believe. And um, and we looked at each other. And we're like, are we really doing this right now? <laughs> this is incredible. And this, it was, it was like, like a big boy offer. It, it, it was, was kind of, yeah, no, it was a big boy offer. And it kind it was, of frightened us. You know, it was it was like, okay, you know, this shit is getting real. And it was our declaration that we are committed to our greater purpose, which is helping our, you know, right, like our state, our vision statement at shared practices is to maximize dentist happiness and career satisfaction. Like that is what we say we are all about and everything we do ties back to that statement. And so that was our way of saying we're putting our flag in the ground and we are committing to doing that on a scale larger than what we can do ourselves. And we're getting somebody who has the experience, the knowledge and everything in place to allow us to deliver. Because that's another thing we, uh, we are absolutely adamant on that we value and you know we wholeheartedly believe what we offer. And we can't do that if we don't get, attract somebody of really high caliber that we believe in their ability to deliver. So, um, you know, we, we absolutely feel so confident in the person that we're bringing on. And I mean, you know, partnering with her in a second practice, I hope would show that, but I mean, I can't emphasize that point enough. For sure. And then, so we prepared the offer. We got it through her. She's a extremely skilled negotiator, I have to say. So, <laughs> uh, kudos to you on that. Um, we finally got the details done by the start of the year. So Suzanne has been working with me uh, a lot this year in creating our new coaching offering that is coming this summer. Um, so Suzanne, talk a bit about what you and I have kind of prepared in, in advance of the launch and um, you know what clients can expect when uh, coaching with you. Absolutely. So first, I want to say, Matt, how often do you remember how often as we were on these, you know, calls together, that we said, hey, I do that. Hey, this is, you know, same philosophy. Hey, this, Mm -hmm. this. So I I just want to kind of kudos the fact that we're on the same page. Um, And again, for, you know, just from a coaching standpoint, I think what what we've talked about earlier in terms of core values aligning and, and all of that. um, But from a hands-on perspective, we really have been working on the um, actual deliverables. On the pre-owner, you guys are are starting that, the pre-owner coaching program that's coming up. And I think, um, you know, for those, whether you're a new doctor or whether you're an existing doctor, having that opportunity to go through that that program, uh, coaching relationship may look a little bit different if you're a new doctor and you don't have a practice yet. Or whether you know you're you're an existing doctor, but that's really creating your roadmap to success. Um, you know, we're some doctors are waiting to find out if they have the right team members or something magically happens. And um, you know, if you're asking me when should they sign up for coaching and and you know when it, when the time is right now, basically, right? Um, every month costs a potential revenue loss. So I think uh, that's what our clients are definitely going to look forward to going forward. I'm really proud of all that we've built in the back end. I think this kind of uh, this COVID was kind of good for us. It allowed us more time to really, really make sure we're got all our ducks in a row. I think the product we're going to deliver is going to be super uh, impactful for dentists and added with your expertise and your um, team training, I think is going to just put our coaching to another level. And having something we can stand behind and believe in fully, I think is so important to us at Share Praxis. Yeah. We want to give you the, the highest level product that we would choose for our own offices. Look at George. She's partnering with her on buying a whole new office. So we fully believe in Suzanne and the product we're delivering. And so I talked to, I don't know if you know this, Suzanne, but I talked to one of your current clients and I asked him, you know, what do you think of Suzanne? And he goes, well, she's like the third or fourth consultant I've had in my career hands down the best in the business. And um, Suzanne's been with that client for over five years. And, you know, that kind of retention and that kind of relationship and that kind of praise. And after that long of a period of time of continuing to want to work with somebody, um, that, I mean, that speaks volumes. And I, I kind of am curious though, because you are so good. You know, what are your, what are your strengths as a coach and your way of, you know, delivering, what are the things that you really feel you offer as a coach? 
Well, we've been talking about metrics. We've been talking about, um, you know, on-site coaching with the team members. We've been talking about leadership training. Um, I think all of those definitely have, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to grow the practices from the ground up. Definitely. So you, what would you say to someone who's um, about to buy a practice? Like, when is the ideal time to bring you on? Because this is probably the question we get the most. Like, I, I, I'm super jazzed about coaching. I want to I want to do it. I just don't know when to do it. So what is an ideal timeline for you? Mm -hmm. Well, we talked about, you know, whether you're a new doctor or whether you're, you're a doctor that's been coaching for a long time. Um, you know, the minute you're, you're really deciding on purchasing a practice. I mean, there's the, there's coaching and leadership and, and roadmap and, and all of that that can be done prior to in terms of, of when you're getting ready to purchase a practice, you know, finding the right team members. If you're an existing doctor, like I said, uh, trying to, um, you know, to wait for that to happen isn't necessarily, uh, let's not wait for coaching to happen for something external to occur. So I think when you're at, tell, asking about the ideal time to hire a coach, I think uh, the minute you're wanting to purchase a practice, the minute you're sensing that you need help. Yeah. And here, here's one question that I had when I started with my coach is like, what separates a uh, what you would deem a successful client versus one who maybe doesn't get the most out of coaching. Because I always was curious, like, who do I have to be? What, what do I have to do to really make this work for me? So what, hold on, before she answers, I, I, that's such a good point because it's funny. I, right. I, I feel like as coaches, we show up the same with every client and <laughs> their experience of coaching. You know, there are some that just propel forward and others, they don't get quite as much out of it. And it's like, well, we show up the exact same. You know, and so it, it's kind of, it's been an interesting thing I've noticed as a coach that I did not realize before I started doing this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, good point. So, uh, you know, you're asking about getting the most out of coaching and, and George, you work with a coach. So, you know, looking within has probably been something that, that has been eye opening for you, right? I mean, starting at the top, I would say that's half the battle, you know, recognizing that uh, the practice needed some change or that you're looking for a practice, um, you know, uh, being comfortable with someone holding you accountable. I think from that standpoint, those clients are going to get the most out of uh, that coaching relationship, seeing your coach as a leadership partner. Um, you know, the largest investment, in my opinion, isn't money in coaching. It's time, it's vulnerability, you know, being being a student, being open to um, looking at things a little differently and wanting to participate in that. You know, a lot of doctors will say, okay, well, you take care of the team and, you know, it'll all be good. And I think when, you, when you're starting that relationship, really, um, you know, my role is, is to work with the doctor as well and to, to get the doctor to see that they have a role in this and it's not just all team related. Yeah. And I think to boil down what you said and what kind of I've noticed, it's the level of commitment. How committed yeah. are you to the results you want? Do you like, do you say you want it or do you actually really want it? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Are you willing to go through the discomfort and when things don't go right, are you able to get through that or are you able, are you going to cower and go back and not actually go through with it? Um, yeah. Like in a less rah-rah way, it's like, you know, Suzanne talked about the vulnerability. Like a lot of times, the flaws in our practices and the things that we're not doing well are directly related to there's some level of discomfort associated with resolving that issue that we avoid. And as the coach, you recognize that and you, you know, you inform your client of what the proper or what the thing that they should do is. And that's pushing them directly into discomfort. And it's, it's, so I'm kind of curious, Suzanne, you know, what are your experiences with that and clients, you know, potentially like having to push them into uncomfortable areas to get whatever is needed done, done. Right. So that, you know, that relationship is, is built on trust, right? So, so when we're looking at what is a trust relationship, then, um, you know, we, we have an opportunity to then impact that. And together, you mentioned, Matt, the commitment level, the commitment level that, that a client is willing to extend their hand and ask for coaching, I think makes the difference here. Absolutely. What What do you feel like is a 
what are like the overarching couple of issues that you tend to see with most practices you first start with? Like where, where I know it's different for every office, but where are like the common areas that dentists are currently stuck that maybe they don't know about? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. It is different for, for different offices. And I think um, I, I mentioned blind spots earlier, you know, every practice has those blind spots, but I think there are some common threads, right? I think, uh, you know, systems, I think would be the biggest thing. I think you mentioned AR, George, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think if I summed it up, I think some of the weak spots have everything to do with a lack of systems, right? Um, how many million dollar practices do you know that don't have systems in place? Right. Most so yeah. most of them, exactly. But outside of dentistry. So, um, you know, I think we can talk about some of those weak spots that are communication between front and back and, you know, is hygiene maximized? But those are those are all all details that come up with, uh, I think, a lack of systems. So that that, in my opinion, is probably the, the common thread in offices. Can you, can you elaborate on that? And, you know, how as a coach, you walk in, identify it and then what you kind of do to rectify that issue? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, earlier we talked about treatment planning and I look I look at the area uh, of a practice just like you guys would look at a mouth, for example, in quadrants. And so if we're looking at focus areas in a practice and, and treatment planning those, um, putting that system in place, whether it's it's on site or on the phone, um, really coaching that team member to understand the why behind that system, right? Why, why does that need to be implemented? And I think that makes all the difference in the world is I, I'm willing to work on reactivation, even though I don't have time, for example, if I understand the why. Is it about keeping patients healthy? So, so going back to, to that why, um, you know, and really working on with the team at a team level, everybody's areas of responsibility. And I'm curious. So uh, I'm in New York. We're st still very much in COVID. I'm not allowed to mm -hmm. go back to work for another couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, other parts of the country have been open for a little while. So what have you seen? Like, How have you had to adjust your advice as a coach uh, coming out of this time and how to you know hit the ground running versus seeing some sort of plateau or dip? Well, interesting, um, you know, interesting conversation we're having with our doctors at this point in time because COVID has hit in, you know, different areas differently. So, uh, for example, some of the local clients are dealing with uh, patients not not really feeling, even though most of the offices are are open or semi open, um, a lot of the practices are dealing with patients still fearful. So we're working on um, really the communication, keeping a line of communication open with patients and you know, all of the things that practices can do. Are they posting regularly to Facebook? Are they keeping in contact with their patients, making sure that, um, that the patients are feeling comfortable communicating all of their, um, you know, safety measures and, and how they're protecting uh, both themselves and the patients? That was a selfish question. I just wanted to know. So thank you. <laughs> I was like, why are we talking about COVID right now? That is so <laughs> like, I get some advice doing ever. this. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, Matt. Oh my gosh. You're 0 for 2. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, Suzanne, I wanted to go back to some of those, you know, you talk about systems and I feel like it has the potential to be a buzzword sometimes that gets thrown around without a whole lot of like details. Like I feel like, um, you know, so can you kind of like unpack like in detail for, for our audience, you know, an example of a system and what it looks like when implemented and what solution it offers the practice? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the AR since, since that, yes, I love is, that. Please. <laughs> since that's a buzzword for you. The um, AR is like my, you know, thorn in my side. Oh my gosh. Geez. With clients. It's, yeah, that's it's a good a question, George. Cause I hated the word systems for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it is, it is an annoying word to me before it, like before you actually understand it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. So, so systems, um, processes, all of these, um, you know, just checklists. I mean, we can use all of those different words, but at the end of the day, accounts receivable is high. So what do we do about it? Right. Yes. Um, and, and George, you had a, a a podcast recently with a, with a, a client that had, you know, a major issue. Yeah. So I'll call that a major issue. Yes. And I think, uh, accounts receivable often falls by the wayside, right? It's the back burner. It's, um, I work on it when I have time to right? not necessarily, um, 
on a weekly basis. So, so when I say system, I mean structure. Who's going to be accountable for this uh, task? So assigning someone in the role. That you know, basically, that's where it starts. I mean, I'll take a step back further and and realizing that there's an issue, assigning yeah. someone to this task going forward, and then just a a step by step process on how am I going to communicate? How am I going to communicate with those that are in the ninety day, sixty day, thirty day window? Um, you know, how, when do I send out statements? What do I send out statements? Um, it encompasses uh, coaching the team members on how to also prevent this from happening again in the future. So if we're taking, if the practice is taking a hit from an AR standpoint right now, then let's line everything up so that this doesn't happen again. Right. Absolutely. Not, not a scary word. Accountability and ownership. Someone has the role of doing that. And there's a pre-doctored best practice for the way it's being done. And we ensure that it's being done that way. And Matt, you mentioned accountability, you know, and I think that's key here as well is, is putting, putting this, this process and this step-by-step in place, and then just kind of hoping and praying that it's going to magically work out, I think is, you know, is, isn't necessarily going to give you the results that you're looking for, but the, the accountability and the measurement and the reporting structure that comes in after that, um, I think is key to getting this measurement moved and uh, making a difference in that accounts receivable. And it's like you said, there, there's no cookie cutter uh, way we coach and there's no cookie cutter way to put in s- systems. Like you can make it as complicated or as simple as you want. You could have the giant checklist that all gets sent to the doctor's office at the end of the day, or you could just make it a verbal thing that you tell someone, Hey, you're an owner. You're like, you're responsible for the AR and report to me if you have any problems. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be this complicated thing if you don't want it to be. Absolutely. And sometimes parts of it get outsourced. You know, it just depends on the practice and it depends on what we're dealing with. And I think there's like a whole underlying conversation about metrics here that is being forgotten because, you know, it's, if somebody identifies what a shared practices do, what is, what do we do that's special on the coaching side? Right, we have a lot of things that we offer, but one of the major solutions that we offer is analytics-based coaching, where we can know. You don't have to tell us what your AR is. We know before the call. We, if if you're not doing it, we're calling you out on it. It's not like, you know, stuff is happening in the practice that we're not aware of. And I think that accountability on two sides, right? The doctor, we teach them how to understand their metrics so that they can hold their staff accountable in the future. And while we're working with them we hold them accountable. And so stuff doesn't get swept under. I think sometimes we take that for granted because we do practice underwater and, you know, we'll go through the whole practice in one episode and we'll identify all the weak points. And I think people sometimes like, okay, you know, that's what they do. That's the way it goes. But I don't think people understand what it's like to be in a coaching relationship without the analytics. It is night and day as George and I have been in one of those. If you don't like as a dentist and you're a new dentist, usually new owner, if you don't identify it as a problem yourself, it won't get coached around in yes. that model. Whereas in ours, it will, whether you like it or not, whether you know mm-hmm. it's there or not, like the, we're the not whole, letting it go on. There's nothing under a rug. No, we the are curtain aware is everything. taken away and you're exposed naked. So you better like how you look. Cause there's no <laughs> hiding. Um, Suzanne, can you talk a little bit about that though? You know, cause you've had experience coaching both ways. You've had pre analytics coaching and you've had post analytics coaching. And, you know, what What has it really opened up for you, too? Because I think that's one area that we really agree on. Absolutely. So um, I think from a, a, a non-analytic standpoint, I think your hands are tied. We end up focusing on one specific area, but we lose sight of the rest of the practice. And so um, unless we're really looking at all the metrics and, you know, as coaches, our job is to look at everything, but to hone in on specific areas that we're going to address over a 30-day window, right? I think... Um, you don't know what you don't know. And so you may be focusing on one area of the practice, but then comes to light some other area of the practice that's actually impacting that area. So knowing that uh, from an analytic standpoint definitely is a, is a plus. I think the one thing it really offers is focus. So when I look at a client's practice before, like they always tell me, do I need to prepare for my calls? No, I'm preparing for your call by mm-hmm. looking at your data. And you know when I get them on the phone, it's really, you know, I already know where their practice is at, 
what is the bottleneck and what needs to, and that's why we've had the growth we've had with our clients because we understand, you know, we're not looking at productions, collections, new patients, you know, we're looking at the impactors of those things and we're, be, we're able to tell what is it holding them back? Because we've talked a lot about, you know, like the systems, that's the how to, and that's the area that pre Suzanne, we, we were kind of lacking is helping clients implement what they need to implement. But what we've always done very well is the what to do. Your practice, your vision, everything encompassed in of itself, what are you doing? And what is the step that you need to do? What is the roadmap? And I think that, you know, one thing that we haven't talked about is, you know, Suzanne and I, you know, we plan on collaborating in the initial be the initial part of the client relationship where, you know, I think one thing I do well as a coach is vision. And, you know, what is the what is the picture that we're trying to paint with a client? And the area where I fall short as a coach is actually building that painting, like actually filling in the lines and painting it the beautiful color. And that's what Suzanne really offers, you know. But Suzanne, can you talk about that collaboration that, you know, we have where, you know, we work together with the client initially and we kind of create that painting, we sketch it, and then you guys together sort of paint it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so George, you mentioned um, having the the unique ability to work on vision. And, yeah. you know, I think there, there's something to be said for that relationship that you have with, uh, with the audience and the doctors listening. And so you starting off that crafting of the vision and really taking our doctors up to a point where, okay, now that vision is, um, as you said, you know, you, you designed the, uh, the, the sort of a scheme of it. And now we're going to uh, you're going to hand that off and and the doctor and I are going to be working on the details, you know, coloring within the lines, basically, and mm -hmm. assigning and, uh, you know, hiring and, and, and assigning the tasks and looking at those processes and measuring those metrics. And, and again, the accountability. So the, the vision is, is basically that starting point. And then the accountability to that vision is everything that we're implementing leading up and, and, and really uh, transpiring to that vision. Yeah. And, you know, it's all about identifying, you know, point A, where are they at today? And then what is point B? Where do they want to be when we're done or when we're not never done, but, you know, when we've gotten them a lot closer to their vision. And that's where I feel like one area that I am, you know, that that's like my special sauce, right? That's what I offer is, you know, helping people paint that picture in their head so that it's very clear. And the area where I'm weak is actually the step-by-step -step things that need to happen to get them there. And I, I want to pivot real quick. So I'm, I'm curious about your guys' relationship as you go into buying a practice. Like what, where do you see Suzanne's role? George, oh, where do you see your role? Like, how's this all working out? Oh, so the cat's out of the bag now, George. Oh man. Oh man. As in, I could talk about that for days. <laughs> you know, I really feel, so one area where, you know, my leadership has been highlighted in my practice is structure. You know, what I do very well is vision and quite frankly, you know, the guts to make difficult decisions and to not let fear stop me from what is best for the practice. That is my unique ability and my ability to relate to doctors. And I think hiring associates, you know, is an area where I'm definitely strong. Um, but man, the the day-to-day -day grind of operating is my weak spot. And that is where I really see Suzanne as a synergistic partner because she offers day-to-day -day implement. When I, you know, her and I sit down, we say the practice needs X, Y, and Z. I know that X, Y, and Z will get done. That's what she brings. Suzanne, can you talk about that? I mean, I, I think we've talked, you know, you know it's, it's funny because you and I sort of have the closest relationship of, you know, anybody at shared practice because we sort of communicate, you know, so much about everything. And um, so can you talk about, I mean, I, for me, it's all about the people you work with and, making sure that on a person to person standpoint, you have a very strong, trusting, vulnerable relationship. And then that translates well into a success. And so can you talk a little bit about so, sort of how we work together in your mind? Absolutely. Well, let, let's go back to that, that practice here for a second, because I think it's important for our audience to, to know, um, you know, it comes from a, a place of a dream of mine for, for a while. And so I feel like the audience should know that George, you're the one I picked to, to, you know, do this with basically, because I've wanted to own a practice for a very long time. And I feel like um, 
that allows us to, to bring another level to our doctors as well as we're going through the hands-on. You know, you're definitely um, in, in patients' mouths, but also you're, you're managing that practice. But now we get a chance to collaborate and see, um, you know, where each other's strengths are and, and put in place everything that we're talking to doctors about and, and coaching. We actually have it live. Um, so, you know, that's, that's been a really exciting uh, opportunity and George, it's been such a short time. You were mentioning at the beginning, you know, six months that we've known each other and now we're going to kind of collaborate on the practice. That's there's something quick. to be said for you guys. <laughs> well, you know, I've been wanting to have the shared practice for a very long time. <laughs> that is um, such that a dumb has, name. No, that is not a dumb <laughs> no, name. No, we've it's talked like, about that forever, right? <laughs> on air. It is going to be called the shared practice. And that is the practice that Suzanne and I share. And um, it's, yeah, it's it's been a long, you know, it's, my my philosophy has really shifted over time where, you know, I, I really introduce people in my life in roles where they fill in areas where I'm weak. And I don't try to be everything in my life. I really try getting people that sort of, you know, more or less complete the things that the areas where I'm weak. And that's where I feel from a shared practices standpoint and from you and I owning the shared practice, you know, it's, there's so many benefits to what you bring. And um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't be more excited about both things simultaneously. It's it's a very cool it's a very cool experience with the same person, Suzanne, to have to be super excited about visions in two different areas. Yeah, I, that's the only place in my life where I have that. There's some lucky patients about to get you too. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and you know, I think the the thing with Suzanne where we all agree is, you know, and this is important from a you know, I think if one thing is obvious and it should be, is that financially that is not our number one incentive in anything that we do. I mean, whether it's a second practice or a, you know, our coaching or anything, we are not driven by our, our primary motivator is not finances. It is really impact and it is spreading, you know, for me, joy and it is, you know, helping people. And I mean, the shared practices podcast right now is the number one rated show in dentistry. And we, I mean, it, when I think about, you know, we're at eight, over 800,000 downloads, the number of people we have impacted through these airwaves and the number of lives we've changed is that is, that is my life purpose really, you know, in a nutshell and translating that to practices, you know, like for me, it's the joy that team members have in practices. And the, and when I own a practice, I want it to be a well-run, you know, thing that I truly, that's where I want to go as a patient. I want to go somewhere like the practice I own or the practices I own. And that's what comes first. And, you know, from, from our perspective, we only surround ourselves with people who feel that same way. And I almost feel like that's, you know, that's where we, that's where I want us to always be. And that's, that's an area where we're never going to change. You know, we're always, you know, mission, vision, values first, and then everything else second. And I mean, can you guys talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like that's kind of a, an area that we all are on the same page on that, you know, maybe our audience doesn't fully understand how much it means to us. Yeah. yeah like I mean, from, go ahead, Suzanne. I was going to say, you know, from my perspective, from the, from the coach's world, not being uh, a clinician, I mean, one of the things that doctors tell me about all the time is the stress level, right? Uh, like I'm stressed, I'm going crazy, you know, or we've got staff turnover, whatever it may be. And I think I hear that more. I hear I have no time. I, I can't spend time with my family and I'm super stressed. And I don't hear, um, you know, money as much. And so uh, our coaching is is definitely along those that realm in terms of being able to um, help doctors reduce that stress. You guys have been preaching this forever. Reduce stress, enjoy life. Um, you know, and if, if we have the ability to catch them early on, I mean, can you imagine the impact we have on doctors that will be starting practices that go into this with a feeling of, oh, I did the right thing rather than a feeling of, oh, am I on the right trajectory here? Or yeah. did I make the wrong choice by going to dental school? Um, and, you know, and, and I think this drills down to Matt, you mentioned patients, you know, I think it drills down to that patient experience, their family's experience. And so I'm super, super excited about the opportunity to, um, to impact them that way. Nice. I mean, for me, I, I'll admit I was, I was money mo motivated for years. That was my motivator. Um, it was only until I went through my life coaching training program that I really distilled actually what was important to me and similar to George top of the list was impact. Like 
of my four core values, that's always the one that most resonates with me. And finding this avenue is the way I've been able to express it. And now has brought as a dental owner, what I bring to my practice is impact impacting staff and patients similar to the way you guys are, are going to operate your office. Um, so I think all of us kind of share that and um, that's really going to come through in everything we provide to the audience. You know, and, and the reality is, you know, I think Suzanne talked about it, but stress level, you know, it's it's funny the impact you can have on somebody early in their career, right? If you coach them their first year or two, that multiplies. It's like exponential. It's like investing, right? When you have like it, it compound interest, that's what it is, you know, in a happiness perspective. And I think it took, for me, it took getting to that point, the top of my so-and-so ladder and realizing that if you don't do it the right way, it sucks. And, you know, it's the most important thing for us to do it the right way and to feel good about everything that we do rather than what we do. I like sleeping at night and getting a good night's sleep. Yeah, so that's time. important. So um, if if it's not obvious to you, we are we couldn't be more excited. I, I don't know how else to like, oh my gosh, this has been six months, more than six months that we've been working on this and to finally release it. And so, you know, starting now, I mean, Suzanne is receiving discovery calls and she's available and we are super excited about, you know, the pivot that we are making for the long-term benefit of our coaching clients, our audience, and shared practices as a whole. Couldn't agree more. We're so happy to have Suzanne. Thank you for joining us. And uh, it, I mean, it's, it's brought a whole new level of excitement for me, for our, our offerings. So super excited to have you on board. Guys, I'm excited too. I can't wait to get started. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks for this episode. Um, this is a little bit different today. Um, but you know, we just, we wanted our chance to really kind of explain everything that we're doing and why, and, you know, I hope you guys are as excited about it as we are. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you guys next week on practice underwater. Thanks for listening to another episode of practice underwater. We'll see you guys next week. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching with either Dr. George Hariri or Dr. Matt Greeno, our contact emails are in the show notes. And if you're interested in being on Practice Underwater as a guest where we can look at your practice anonymously, you can go ahead and contact the email in the show notes and follow those directions to get on the show. Thanks, and we'll see you guys next week on Practice Underwater.